welcome everyone. So we are going to get started right on time. Um, and I'm so excited to welcome you to Data Byte 160, Black Maternal Health is in Crisis, Can Technology Help? Uh, my name is Joan Mukagosi. I am a research analyst on the Trustworthy Infrastructures team at Data and Society, and I will be the host and the moderator of today's conversation. Um, this event is supported by our assistant producer, Tunika Onekakami. Could not be done without her. Um, and for those who are joining us for the first time, a bit about Data and Society. Um, Data and Society is an independent research institute studying the social implications of data and automation. We produce original research and regularly convene multidisciplinary thinkers like the ones we have today um, to challenge the power and the purpose of technology in society. Um, so we're going to be spending the next hour together, so I'd love to get us grounded um, in what we're going to be talking about today. Um, so today's Data Byte celebrates the launch of my report, uh, Establishing Vigilant Care, Data Infrastructures, and the Black Birthing Experience. Um, in it, I write about three kinds of data collection that Black pre pregnant patients experience, um, the electronic health record, Medicaid enrollment, and femtech devices. Um, and I explore how these forms of data collection place uh, Black patients in particular and birth workers at risk of exposure to carceral systems. Um, I identify a subset of birth workers called Black-centered birth workers, who engage in a vigilant practice, shout out to the title, um, that negotiates the benefits of data collection against their capacity for harm. Um, so through methods of evading, finding compromise, uh, and refusing data collection, uh, these Black-centered birth workers assert that Black patients' right to privacy, to access, and to knowledge about and ownership of their data are reproductive justice imperatives. Um, so to help unpack this topic, we are joined uh, by two amazing experts in this space, Dr. Mary Fleming and Ijeoma Uche, um, who again, are two just incredible experts in the world of data-driven maternity care uh, for patients of color. Um, so I'm so excited to introduce them. Um, first, Dr. Mary Fleming, um, who works clinically in Baltimore, Maryland and Louisville, Kentucky, and is a co-founder and chief medical officer for Kayaba Care, a maternal health startup in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Um, since 2021, she has served as the director of the Leadership Development to Advance Equity in Healthcare program in the Department of Executive and Continuing Professional Education at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Um, we're also joined by Ijeoma Uche, who is the co-founder of Birth by Us, a postpartum and pregnancy app created to empower women of color to shape their own birthing experience while giving providers and hospital systems the insights to best support their pregnancy, birth, and postpartum journey, uh, and reduce preventable maternal health deaths and complications. Um, so some true multi-hyphenates um, that I'm really excited uh, to chat with today. Um, so we're going to dive right into the discussion. I'd love if you could both uh, speak to some of the risks involved in increasingly data-driven care. We know that this conversation is happening under a context of a maternal health crisis for Black pregnant, pregnant people. So I'd love if you could talk about how these risks affect Black patients in particular, um, and also, if I might add, how you are working um, to mitigate these risks. Who would you like to start? Would you like to start, Mary, since you're on the mic? <laughs> <laughs> well, first, I want to say thank you for inviting us and having this conversation. Um, as we as we were prepping, we both know this is complex and multifactorial, and it's going to be hard to uh, digest in a short amount of time. But I appreciate your report. It is very thorough and, and gets to a lot of nuances that I don't think we often uh, talk about on a day to day basis. So happy um, to be in great company and have this um, dynamic conversation. So I'll say that first. Um, and, you know, I think data is exciting and it's also quite scary. Like, where are we getting the data? How are we collecting the data? Who owns the data? Um, but we also know we need data in order to make change. We need to know who we're treating, where they are, what their needs are, how to address those needs. And so we can create 
um, programs and innovations and opportunities to address those needs. But to your point, as we get more people's personal information, are we housing it? Are we using it? Are we utilizing it in the right way to protect the people that we're also trying to serve? And so I think that's that's the nuance, right? How do we do both at the same time? Um, and, and how do we mitigate those risks? I think for most people, as we interface with the healthcare system, we're not thinking about that. We're, we're accessing care. We're filling out the forms. Um, we don't know what happens to our data. We don't know who it gets shared with. There's this, I mean, I think Fundamentally, we, we still trust the healthcare system to a degree that they're going to do right by us. We sign our HIPAA form, right, and they're gonna they're gonna they're gonna trust our data and they're gonna do what they're supposed to do with it. Um, but we really don't know what how people share the data, and I think part of you know again as we were prepping for this conversation, as policies have shifted and how people use um, information, how people chart information, record information, is 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 evolving so that we're not putting people at risk. Um, I think for us, I mean, as for me as, as a clinician, of course, I want as much information as possible so I can take the best care of you um, and making sure that I, as an individual provider, record that in a way that's going to honor what you need and, and make sure you have an optimal experience. Thinking about kind of a, a, me as a systemic provider and, and, and how do we um, think about this when we create solutions? What information do we get? What do we record? What do we report back and share with our partners? You know, we're very mindful of that. And I think it's also regional. So you mentioned I work in a few different states, right? Um, and so the the issues that may I may think about in Kentucky may be different than those in Maryland, right? And happen to be mindful of regional differences and policy changes and um, what access people may have to information is a challenge. So the short answer is, um, I think it's a conundrum that we don't have a simple answer to, but I think it is one of those things that we do need to keep talking about and being mindful of, and especially how it changes across the country and how it is actively changing in our country in real time. So um, I, I just think we have to be mindful of that at, at every step of the road. And, and I'll say this and, and pass it over, um, being mindful not on just the healthcare provider. So I know we're going to get deeper into birth workers in general, right? And so uh, the birth worker journey is not just clinical clinicians and clinical providers, but also the healthcare experience is not just clinicians and, and healthcare providers, right? We talk about the person that you meet at the front desk, the person does the claim data, all of those people also see your information, right? And and how do we mitigate those risks along the way as well, um, I think is, is part of the conversation. Well, you summed it up very well, Mary. Um, and it's such a complicated question as well. <laughs> Um, I think I would, I would, the one thing I would add to this conversation is just as we move towards um, digital health and specifically AI um, and just algorithm bit bias, um, I think we need to be a little bit more attentive of the models and the data that we're using um, so that we're not continuing, uh, continuing the existing disparities and also systemic um, biases that exist currently in the space and in research. Um, so what that entails is, is using diverse data sets and representative data sets, implementing uh, mechanisms where we're detecting and correcting bias if it does exist in algorithms, um, developing a diverse team that has different perspectives that are able to catch any biases and also achieve this culture specific um, care that we're really trying to achieve as we treat uh, communities of color. And I think last thing that I would add, um, and, and it's I think it's in unison of what Mary said um, previously, is just being able to um, empower patients with their own um, um, own data and education, so patient education, so they can make the right decisions. Um, what what do we need to do in order for to equip patients with the information they need in order to make the right decisions for themselves and their families? Um, I say this in a way where I should, hopefully patients aren't scared. Um, I think that there are a lot of innovations out there. There are a lot of apps out there. There are a lot more um, startups that's going to be coming up, especially as we move towards a, a really focused digital health world. 
And I say this in a white way where we should be excited and not fearful, but we should also be able to ask questions. Um, ask, you know, ask the company where the data is going. What is it being used for? Um, is, it, is it automatically shared with government agencies? Is it HIPAA compliant? Um, can you opt out of your data, uh, your, opt, opt, to, opt out of data sharing? Um, I know I'm based in California. So um, although, um, you know, one big thing in a post a Roe v. Wade climate, obviously, there's a lot um, without this protection, there's information that's collected in applications that potentially can be subject to legal scrutiny. Um, and in a lot of the states that adopted, um, um, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> adopted a limited abortion access are states where over 50% of black of black populations live. Um, and, you know, California, abortion remains legal, but they also have policies that limit um, the ability for data sharing and, and promote data privacy. And I think that states should continue to adopt these practices as we continue to move towards a digital world, because um, it's just inevitable we will be there. It's just how, we, how can we be there sooner and with the right practices. I think you both raised great points and um, thank you for answering such a complex question in such a clear way. And I think you both spoke to the fact that we're in this period of like transformation and evolution where we're seeing more and more um, data driven responses uh, to, to the black maternal health crisis. Um, and one of the major findings of the report is that this move towards more like digitized care clashes with like the hands-on and sometimes like low tech um, work that a lot of birth workers traditionally uh, practice. Um, so again, a question for both of you, could you talk about how you navigate the tension between maternity care being like a deeply personal and high touch, you know, like catching babies kind of care. Um, and then simultaneously the move towards increasingly data-driven documentation and assessments and, and, and collection. I guess I'll go first since I'm unmuted already. <laughs> Um, I think it, it involves finding a balance um, that improves rather than uh, detracts or takes away a patient's experiences. I really think it's everything centered around the, the, you know, your patient's experience, right? So with digital health or mHealth, um, you know, we shouldn't try to replace in-person care. I don't think it will replace in-person care. I think what we recognize at Birth by Us is like our efforts of centering, amplifying birth birthing professionals and community organizations and community related, related um, um, services. So we're basically tightening up that bridge between patients and these and these vast range of resources that are already available and that has been available for for decades upon since um I would say decades I mean not say centuries but decades that have been doing an amazing work um, that patients or families just don't know about um so I think that the role of digital health or just m health is just to be able to bridge gaps in care um yeah I'll, I'll stop there and let and let Mary touch in yeah, I mean, I think I think that's the that's the key, like bridging these gaps in care and recognizing the evolution of medical care across the boards. I mean, we're talking specifically about maternity care today, but it's not just limited to maternity care. And the broader conversation, which we probably won't get to, is the healthcare system in general, our reimbursement system, our the policy at that level influences a lot of how and why. Um, the way people historically access maternity care has changed um, from, you know, back in the day when we were midwifery at home driven, right, to the hospital based care um, that was still relatively personalized to now that what people are reacting to is this somewhat disjointed care. Um, where you don't get to see your primary OB provider, your primary midwifery provider continuously through the um, pregnancy and postpartum experience. And so, and, and as Gioma mentioned, like it, it, when we're talking about doulas, right, they're not new. It's not a new concept, right? It's something that's been around for a long time. But I think the reason why their importance is rising is because of this, how the healthcare is, um, infrastructure has kind of forced this disjointed care over time. So people are looking for something continuous, something, um, like you said, high touch, personalized along the way. And and, um, and, to, and just to plug Kayaba Care a little bit, that's one of the things we do with our maternity navigators that are also doula trained, right? We try to match you with somebody who understands where you are, you are and provides that personalized journey through the pregnancy and postpartum care, uh, care journey. But I think 
back to the original question, um, I think we have to do all the things at the same time. And I think as we go through the conversation though, it's how, but, but how do we talk to each other? And I think part of what has happened um, because of these rising, and we'll say falling, but changing evolutions of um, the OB journey, if you will, uh, we haven't consistently or ever had a training mechanism where everybody I was trained at the same time um, to understand the the scope of care, but also just kind of how do you how do you evolve in a space where um, you maximize the benefit for our patients, right? And so the reality is most people might need a little bit of everything. You just because you have a doula and a midwife doesn't mean that you don't need an OB, right? Uh, because we all have different things to offer. So how do we give you everything that you need in the safest way possible so that you can have a healthy and successful pregnancy? That's the goal, right? That's what everybody wants. And so I think these are the types of conversations that we need to have so that we can get back on the same page, stay patient-centered, uh, knowing that's who we, we're, we're optimizing for, and how do we all use our, our our benefits and our expertise to maximize that experience. Um, and so that people can feel like their their needs are met, the gaps are filled, um, but we're also being clinically safe and optimizing outcomes. Great, I mean, great answer to this question. And I think like <laughs> these are things that folks when receiving care, like might not always consider in, in these sort of like complex ways. I think you're right. The end goal is a safe, you know, healthy and happy pregnancy. Um, but all of these different sort of small considerations along the way are sometimes hidden from the patient perspective. Um, I want to shift towards like some of the specific kinds of data collection uh, that I mentioned in the report. Um, and Mary, for those who aren't familiar, I was wondering if you could explain the sort of before and after of the introduction of the elect electronic health record uh, in medicine, particularly in maternity care. It's something that patients interact with all the time but might not know. Um, and yeah, I, I wonder if you could talk about how that has sort of maybe changed uh, the practice of, of maternity care um, and maybe even medicine more broadly. Yeah, to not date myself, because I still think, I, I mean, I look relatively young, right? Say yes, say yes. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, going through um, medical training, I was there when, you know, we were still handwriting charts, faxing records, um, very, at the very introduction of electronic medical records. And we were all super excited about it, right? You know, the, the joke, of course, is that physicians don't have good penmanship. My penmanship is still good. Um, but, you know, you wanted things that are legible, that are translatable, that are easy to share. And so uh, being able to trans translate into an electronic medical record that was, you know, digital, you know, you don't have to go to the, the chart where the patient was to see what was going on with them. Um, there was some checks and balances that you put in orders and the pharmacist can look at them in real time and make sure that we are reducing medical errors that way. Um, we're able to, especially for, for um, maternity, look at the fetal heart tracing. We don't have to just look at it in, in, in the room with the patient. We can see, see it at the nursing station and beyond. And so it has really given us an ability to access and share data in a way that, that we haven't before. And even thinking about, you know, fast forward to the last few years with the my charts and the like, uh, where patients can access their data in real time read the notes that, that we write. It adds an, an extra level of accountability and, and interest, I will say, uh, <laughs> to the, the healthcare journey. But going back to, we talked about like who owns your data and that gives you more ownership of, of what, uh, knowing what people are writing about you and what that means and how to understand your healthcare journey. So it has definitely been an evolution and I think mostly positive. Um, I think the, the challenges still remain because we we didn't do it as a cohesive unit. We talk about the healthcare system again being broken. So we have multiple EHRs. Um, they don't all talk to each other. They don't talk to each other. Some of them do, but still challenging across states, right? And, and across the country. Um, for maternity specifically, we often work in multiple um, channels. So we might have the EHR for the OB care. We might have the EHR for the pregnancy um, 
of the pregnancy, the delivery journey. So just during labor and delivery, I have a different thing for to put orders in. And all of that may be in the inpatient journey. And then you have a whole different one from the outpatient journey. And then for patients who don't go to the same inpatient um, uh, provider that they do outpatient, those don't always marry. So that that is still is a challenge. It's a recognized challenge. I think there are definitely people who are working on it, but I think that inoperability um, is a challenge. I think the other thing is, so just because we have a way, we have something to capture the data, we still have to put the right data in there. Um, and so a lot of places are still not capturing racial and ethnicity and, and gender data. Uh, pregnancy data can sometimes be missing or incomplete, um, especially when we're thinking about, you know, the worst outcomes like maternal mortality. You know, we need that to be complete data. And then even when you go to things like you think about things like death certificates, those are often outside of the EHR. Those are still handwritten forms um, that we fill out. And so then they have to be scanned in and that type of thing. So there's still even though we have gone a long way, there are still gaps in um, the optimization of our digital record. Also, Great point. And I will say I'm one of those people that reads all of my notes in my EHR after I'm done with the doctor's visit. Um, and I tell everybody to do the same. Um, but yeah, not everybody knows that they can access that. And also not everybody has access to these portals, right? We've talked a lot about how we operate under this patchwork healthcare system in the United States where your access to these different types of services depends on like a lot of different things. We talked about your like the state that you live in, but also like socioeconomic factors, right? Like um, income and even just access to a doctor. Um, and so I wonder, like we, Femtech is sort of like entering this space to sort of fill these gaps. Ijeoma, you talked about filling those gaps in care. And I'm wondering if you could describe um, how Femtech is revolutionizing birthing experiences specifically for patients and providers of color. Um, and under the context that, you know, Femtech at large is really designed for a user that is white, that is middle class, that is a, a cisgender and heterosexual woman. Um, so I'd love if you could talk about some of the innovations in this space to speak to the experiences specifically of patients of color and the needs of providers of color. Yeah, I think it is in several ways, which is really exciting as a young professional in this space. Um, it's, it's it's really exciting. <laughs> but I think that digital health applications in general create this unique opportunity to create person-centered care. Um, and, and, and the I think the process of creating person like patient centered care is it takes a lot of time. It's time intensive um, and involves um, outreaching patients or populations that are considered hard to reach in research. Um, but it's doing it in, in a way where it's efficient, it's time effective, and um, it's also engaging. Right. So we're, we're in a we're in a time period where we're reaching the people or we're, we're, we're making the method to reach the, the populations that are typically communities of color who are have haven't usually had a seat at the table and we're bringing them to the table and I think that's one big thing about digital health that I'm excited about uh, another thing is improving the um, care delivery in general so enabling um, um, access to care in a more convenient way um, if we think about uh, communities of color specifically black women and, and black um, birthing people um, a lot uh, you see the trends of, of increased uh, maternal deaths and complications um, as well as limited access or being able to go back to, and, 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 and um, fulfilling that postpartum appointment because of various reasons, and one thing is transportation. Um, maybe it's um, they, that they are that they had um, an issue with their care team, and they were less likely. Maybe it's um, um, not being able to um, have have. Um, Having having the people around them to support them to take care of the other children, so being able to leverage technology in a way where we can uh, meet them, be, truly meet patients where they are, um, is one big thing that I that I'm excited about, and I think that it's it's kind of revolutionizing it in the space of maternal care in general. Um, it, thinking about uh, improving um, diagnosis and treatments, and in a way where it's um, very time sensitive, specifically in pregnancy and postpartum, um, leveraging um, data to be able to identify trends um, and 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 compile that with with um, social economic and, and factors, whether it's income, whether it's uh, food insecurity, everything like creating this full comprehensive picture of what it is to of what what that user or that patient is. Um, I, another thing that I'm really excited about is patient empowerment. So we are 
we're, we're seeing a lot of trackers and wearables. <laughs> um, and it's all flashy, but it, and, and but essentially it's helping um, us and birthing people and our users being able to take control and take charge of their care in a way that we haven't seen before. Um, I, I'm not sure about you, but last time someone handed me a pamphlet in a, uh, in a, in a medical appointment or afterwards, I did not read <laughs> half of what was, what was on that paper. And I don't expect um, um, other mothers who have a really busy schedules or stressing about, um, you know, the next thing that they have to do or just moms who are really busy um, that, you know, expecting them to, to sit down and read really crucial information um, about their care um, and then faulting them to, you know, because you gave them the pamphlet that they should have known. Um, I think that we should move away from that and adopt more modern practices and being able to have easy, accessible, reliable, crucial, digestible information, um, as well as resources and support to be able to empower them to make informed decisions and being able to, to you know, um, take control of their birthing experience. And I, I always say take control of their birthing experience because it, it really is in this fragmented healthcare system, you, you are this, you, you have to take control of your healthcare, your, your own um, journey, your healthcare um, through this, you know, this fragmented system, because at the end of the day, um, you know, it, it's really hard to maneuver all these big pieces and it will take time and on, on a bigger, a bigger um, institutional level. So, um, so I'm hoping that um, with more information um, as digital health, health interventions are able to equip um, users and um, birthing people with the essential data and insights that they need in order to make actionable steps towards a more healthier journey for them and their families, um, we're able to still have time in the back end um, and change and, and create policies to create these trends towards a more unison um, system for, for future mothers. Um, and I, I think one last thing is, is that one big thing about just like digital health in general is that there's a lot more, there's a lot of re translational research that's being put into play in real time. And I, um, so for example, gestational diabetes, which is a common maternal complications that affects 14% of pregnancy, especially it disproportionately affects a black woman and it increases your risk of type two diabetes by seven folds. Um, and there are clear guidelines as probably Mary knows, very clear guidelines um, that you should take a two our oral uh, glucose tolerance test um, in your postpartum period. Um, and that's something that's still not adopted. It's still, it's very, there's, there's a very low um, people who'd go through that postpartum screening. And I think that one, one study that I would love to, you know, take some time to amplify is, is this phenomenal intervention called Sunrise led by Dr. Susan Brown at UC Davis. And, um, and what they're doing is, is taking a novel theory driven digital health intervention and targeting patient level barriers to uptake postpartum care for di um, diabetes prevention for gestational diabetes. And just looking at that, like taking evidence-based research and translating it into communities is something that we should be excited about and acting more towards as we, uh, again, move towards a digital health world, which is inevitable. <laughs> yeah. No, really well said. And it leads me into my next question here, because like, on the one hand, you know, we talk about all of the barriers to receiving care and also like accessing some of these digital products, whether that's are still poor uh, broadband and internet um, infrastructure in the United States that needs still a lot of work. Um, there was a quote from a practitioner um, in the report who says that she would just love to prescribe someone a cell phone for, you know, her patients who might be sharing a phone with their partner or, you know, don't have like the type of device that allows them to access their EHR, um, has to go, you know, to a public library to be able to, to do video sessions, um, that all of these problems need fixes as well. Um, but then on the flip side, um, having this explosion of uh, digital health technologies that are needed, um, as you said, in this landscape where it's kind of up to you to get the care that you need um, in a lot of these instances. Um, and so in the absence of like systemic change in our healthcare system, folks are looking for really individualized uh, solutions um, for their own um, sort of like healthcare needs. Um, and so I think like one of the, one of the things that healthcare workers and like that were interviewed for this study really, really emphasized um, was like this need to take the wealth of data that's already collected about patients, right? Like in the midst of this like ongoing digital health revolution um, and actually like turn it into actionable um you know, change, innovation, tools, solutions. Um, and so I guess this is a question for both of you. Um, what is like, what is the next step with all of this information? Are we actually changing outcomes with 
all of the stuff that we're collecting about patients, whether it's digitally or again, even like through Medicaid enrollment, which asks so many questions, uh, collects so much data uh, about patients. Like, yeah, what is the next step with this stuff? What do we actually do with it? Mary, I'll let you start. It looks like you have uh, some thoughts on this. <laughs> Oh, wait, you're, you're muted. You're muted. <laughs> I was going to say, no, no, I don't need to start. <laughs> um, and, and, I mean, I, I'll, I'll give some brief thoughts and, and, and it looked like Ijeoma has, has some thoughts as well. You know, I, I think it's hard. I, I, you know, I, I think it's a struggle because um, it is an overwhelming amount of information and how do we use it well, efficiently, in the right way and connecting people to the right resources in real time. Um, and you think about, uh, and as you were talking, I was thinking about uh, some of the EHRs are getting, you know, smarter and smarter as we, we think about all of these, um, especially as we get into AI, but uh, with helping in cl clinical decision-making and, and even as Ijeoma was talking about the diabetes, right? So thinking about, is there um, a pop-up that says this person is re recently pregnant did she get, did she have diabetes? Has she had her two hour postpartum uh, diabetes follow-up? When we think about things like maternal mortality, you know, is there a box? You know, this person just came in and had a catastrophic event. Was she pregnant in the last year? Um, when we think about, you know, when we think about diabetes, we also think about blood pressure, right? And if you have preeclampsia during pregnancy, it also increases your risk. Um, so did this person have preeclampsia during pregnancy? Was this person scheduled with the PCP follow-up for ongoing blood pressure control? So there, you know, there's interesting things that I think we can, we can add into the um, clinical de decision-making protocols that can be helpful and in increase and mitigate risk going on, going forward. Uh, but I think, you know, we also go back to, we're still missing, you know, we still have these big data gaps, right? And so how do we fill those data gaps? And then, you know, we also talk about these trends that I, I think we can trust, but I think they're not, they're still not complete. And so if you think about, we have all this access to data now, and we're comparing it to what we think the data was 50 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, but that, that data was also incomplete. And so are we really getting a full picture of where we are, where we're going and where we've been? And so I think, that probably should be where, um, if, if we were gonna dig in deep, I would like a true picture. Was that data that we're comparing ourselves to accurate? Um, giving us a true sense of where we are today and then trying to figure out what the gaps are going forward. And then and, and going back to this compete, I like to say competing priorities, right? And so this notion that we're not we're not getting the care that we need because we're uninterested or unavailable. We don't show up versus we don't have access. We've got five other things going on. We've we're taking care of not just ourselves and our families, but our family's family. Right. Um, if you're asking me to come for a 15 minute appointment that requires a two hour bus ride, I, you've got to make a decision about that. Right. And so, I, you know, doing a little bit of work about reframing on, on um, how, how and why people access care, and again, giving them as much empower, empowerment and advocacy to do what they can do closer to closer to home, not necessarily just physically, but making it um, as easy to access as possible, um, and, and just giving people the benefit of the doubt and, and helping them navigate what it continues to be um, an, an evolving and complex system. So I'll stop there. You said it perfectly again. <laughs> you mentioned all the all the big things. I think one thing I would add to that is that I'm just, you know, a lot of emphasis on data sharing. Um, I think there should be some institution that like like enforces nationwide data sharing because I think that there are a lot of barriers um, of cross institutional like you know data sharing whether it's your um you know in in California versus Georgia I grew up in Georgia um or in if if you're in um you know New York it's really hard to get patient data you know and and uh, obviously there's HIPAA law uh, compliances and laws and regulations however people who are in those spaces already um are 
are and and are go through the right processes and procedures should be able to reach to to have um, you know access to this data to be able to create this full picture of what, like the picture that Mary um, was was mentioning and and just to go uh, just to um, also kind of go off of of what it would look like in in terms of you know moving towards more remote patient monitoring and and this necessity to, to try to to like really see what that looks like and put more effort to it um i, I think that that's just a necessity because we're we're moving towards a, um a unfortunately a world where where there's a lot more maternity deserts than 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 there should be over 200 million women of childbearing age live in maternity deserts um in california alone um 46 hospitals closed in the last 10 years um so over a dozen closed in the last and in 2023. So, and this is because of high cost labor shortages, things that can be like, you know, solved, or if not, um, you know, some what a resolution through digital health that we need should take a little bit more seriously. And in terms of creating the right opportunity space and um, resources in order to make, you know, make some, make some real time changes and real, um, you know, real changes that will lead us to where moms are able to receive care on time, whether it's through telehealth, whether whether it's um, you know being able to um, you know get a, get an Uber to an appointment instead of taking a two hour uh, bus ride, so how can we start thinking around like outside of the box of what you know this new version of healthcare should look like for mothers for for in postpartum and pregnancy and even when we talk about postpartum in research terms we talk we talk about one year postpartum but in reality we've talked to moms and they've told us that they're forever in postpartum so. <laughs> Um, so really just identifying with the community and listening to them. And um, I think we, we always say like, listen, then build, right? So listening, listening to them and listening to their needs and, and seeing that, okay, um, uh, Medicaid covers up to six, six months, and then they transitioned into 12 months, which is amazing. And then let's, let's extend that to 24 months, right? And like, what will it take? And what, what is it, what type of metrics will, are we, are we, do we need to track in order for that to, to happen? So I, I think that's, that's my tidbit there. <laughs> no, great point. And like, my hope is that this falls upon the ears of folks who can make these types of changes. Um, okay, so I have one last question before we dive into the Q&A. So folks, if you have questions, please feel free to pop them uh, into the Q&A box. Um, and I apologize because I'm going to go a little bit rogue. This wasn't in the questions that I prepared for you both. So feel free to throw it back in my face and say, no, thank you. Um, but you both brought up uh, the growth of, like, uh, of AI in clinical decision making and um, in you know recording clinical notes and all of these things and one of the findings from the report was that uh birth workers really exercise agency to say you know i'm not going to collect for example this piece of information because it could put my patient or myself at risk i'm going to deliver the care but that doesn't need to be in the clinical note um so i'm wondering if you could talk about um those new advancements and some of the uh risks that you you might consider or anticipate um, with those new innovations? Like what should we be considering as we see these very shiny new um, advancements? Um, you know, how does that might like impact like the actual delivery of care? And again, what are the risks that folks might might think about um, when when seeing these these changes in the news? Um, I would add my two cents a little. Um, I, I guess like for this, I think that what we need to do is take a step back and really understand the right ways to record patient information, right? I think that when you first off, educate and telling patients that they're able to read their information and they're able to check. And before a, a provider signs uh, their chart, they, they should be able to go through their chart with their patient, right? Because there has been a record and the research has shown that providers use certain terms that uh, may, you know, lead down a, an appropriate path. Right for especially for communities of color, which will um, which um, that path leads to less access, just being able um, being discriminated against, and also just this perpetuation of racism. And, and we're not and and but the thing about it is we're scared to call it racism, right? Um, so I I think that we should take a step back and see who's writing the notes. 
Um, are they receiving the right training? Um, is this the, is and, and, my, and I'm not saying the, the previous training was wrong training. I think that with new information, we should adopt those those new practices into what we have now. So I, I think it starts there, um, and then and then we can go forward. Um, but that's that's I, I, I like that's where I leave I lie my piece. <laughs> Yeah, you know, and, and I think I alluded to the the access to your, I, I'm, I, let's be clear, I'm very much a fan. I think everybody should read their own chart. Um, but I also think it speaks to health literacy, right, which is a whole nother thing that we didn't dive into. Um, because what sometimes does happen is, is reading a chart with medical jargon um, can be confusing and overwhelming and, and sometimes misinterpreted. So I think that gives us also an opportunity to read to re-educate on both ends, how how providers and clinicians input data, and then better educating our patients on how to understand what's in their chart. I think that's I think that's a big opportunity. Um, and then I think another one is is thinking about how do we use this opportunity to coalesce um, to actively work towards policy th policy change. I think this is also a unique time where we have we have great innovation in femtech right we have um, clinicians who are actively engaged in this conversation probably more than we have been before for better or worse because it's actually challenging our ability to practice right now you're saying that i'm trying to take the best care of my patient but you're going to criminally punish me that's unfair and inappropriate and so i think it has it has catapulted more clinicians and physicians into the conversation. And then I think we have our, our midwives and especially our doulas who are non-clinical um, participants in the birth journey, but are especially trained in empowerment and advocacy, right? And so I think how do we harness all of these things to continue to have the policy conversations around maternal health. When you think about and going back to the reimbursement arm, women's health in general and, and maternal health specifically are underfunded across the board, right? And you talked about the closure of the hospitals and labor and deliveries and all of these maternal de deserts, which are directly correlated to our reimbursement policies. So if we wanna take care, better care of, of women and, and birthing people, we have to start uh, challenging as a group the policies that impact the the inability of us to, to affect change on a greater level. So again, I can go on and on about that. But I think this is a unique intersection in time where everybody is is talking about it, and we we should try to maximize this to really change the policies on a larger level. Great way to like end us off in this, you know, in this part of the panel. Um, and I'm with you. I really, really hope that this conversation, the research, um, again, reaches those policy ears to make some of those changes that are really, really necessary in this space. Um, all right, so we're gonna transition to the Q&A. Um, we have some amazing questions um, here for us. So I think uh, I'll start with this question from Jordan Wrigley. And I will say I'm winging it on the pronunciation of these names, so I hope I get them right. Um, but we have a question here about data privacy. So how does data privacy factor into your work? Does it feel like uh, extensive data collection on patients and providers of color? Um, comes with risks as well as benefits. Um, and I think this is a, a great kicker here. How might you think about this issue in terms of HIPAA protected data versus the consumer health space? Um, so like the health trackers and the apps. I mean, I, I can start a little bit. I mean, this is part of our ongoing conversation at Kayaba because we, we are, we're, we're both, right? So we have an in-person component with our maternity navigators and then of course they're supported by other specialists like our nurse practitioners lactation consultants and dietitians so you know a little bit of the more traditional clinical um, um, relationship if we if you will but also we do a significant part of our uh, uh, intervention virtually and we have the app right so we have to kind of think about this protection across the gamut um, and, you know, our traditional, like, you know, getting people's information, verifying insurance and all of that, um, making sure that our, 
our internet is secure, <laughs> right? And we're doing the, the basic stuff. Are you in a safe space? Are you in a confidential space? Do I have permission to talk to you? Like the basic stuff beyond the security things. Um, and then thinking about app protection, right? And, and being very uh, mindful about cybersecurity. And then, you know, then we think about the sharing of data. We talked a lot about sharing of data and wow, that's great, but even sharing of data with, with um, other providers and payers is, a, is another avenue of where security can be breached. So it's an ongoing conversation, um, making sure that we have the, um, you know, the appropriate security measures across the board that fit the the way in which we're interacting with our with our members and our patients um, but I think it's tough I think it's you know it's it's challenging when you operate into in multiple spaces and multiple lanes um, I think we well we didn't talk about it here but in your report you also talked about even with the EHR level all those things are expensive cybersecurity is expensive and so if you're a small entity a new startup um, being able to build in the finances for those security is, is also something that you have to think about because um, it's important. You got to have it. Um, and how do you build the, the infrastructure and whatever the payment mechanism is to cover it is something that that can be challenging to, to smaller entities as well. Yeah, I'll hop in and say that um, I spoke with birth, birth workers who worked at birth, smaller birth centers who ended up having to opt for insecure EHRs because they they just couldn't afford the secure systems. And so they had to just like make that compromise and say, okay, maybe the system won't be interoperable if, you know, we, ha we have to translate this data to a hospital or maybe the system won't be as secure as we want it to be. So like people are making really tough decisions in that landscape. Um, Ijeoma, do you want to re respond to this question as well? Yeah, I think I can uh, talk in the perspective of young startups with <laughs> that has to work with a limited budget. And some methods that we've been able to adopt as we continue to grow is one, encouraging our, our users to talk to us, to email us, to ask us questions, um, making our data privacy um, um, very visible, um, not hiding it anywhere, um, using encryption as as much as we can um, that that will still allow us to use the, our, the, our algorithm. Um, being able to uh, partner with companies who do who are who um, do HIPAA compliance in an a affordable price range, right? Because uh, there are companies out there that um, work with startups that know they have limited budgets but want to serve their communities in impactful ways that will be able that um, offer those services. So those are some things that we've been able to um, do in the meantime as we adopt even more secure. I'm not, so I, I think that right now, um, any if there is any anything that was wrong or any questions um our, our users are are hopefully don't feel um, afraid to email us or um you know give us give us a call and, and ask us as, as many questions as they want because we welcome them we want the, their answers their questions to be answered and to, for them to feel secured and um not hide anything in any way so um, i think that my team does a great job doing that especially with how lean we are right now yeah, and I think that work is so important because one of the arguments that I make in the report is that no matter how a patient, a Black patient in particular, decides to seek care, whether that's um, through a doula, through a femtech service, through a hospital, they deserve the same rights to privacy, um, no matter, again, like how they choose to receive care. Um, and so, yeah, again, hopefully this is change that happens in this space. Um, all right. So we have another question here from Maria Antoniak. Um, they say, I'm curious about your general impressions of chatbots powered by large language models. So that would be like chat GPT, um, Gemini, I think is Google's um, version of this. Um, Meta has one as well. Um, their industry attempts to build applications meant to be used by people seeking care. We see this a lot in the femtech space, right? Just speak to our chat bot that will answer your questions about um, maternal health. Um, Maria says, I'm thinking about topics that have come up in this conversation, like giving patients access and agency, right? Some of the benefits of these things, but also worried about the risks, right? What are the risks of just going to a chat bot um, when you're seeking care? Um, well, you know, so Maria, that definitely gives me pause. Uh, <laughs> but I will say, uh, you know, I, I do think there's some utility of it. I mean, we know I, now I'm also not an AI expert. So take this, you know, where, where my lane is, I'm in this. Bunch. Um, but, you know, we do know that people, act, you know, 
Google, the Google Doc, right? They're going to go to Google and Google their system. They're going to systems and then, you know, come to us and tell us what, what's wrong with them. Um, and that's been a challenge. And I, I don't think that's going to be mitigated by the AI generated um, platforms as well, uh, because they're, they're using information, um, limited information to derive an outcome that might be inappropriate. Um, so I do agree. I, I, I know that there's agency there. Uh, I think I think really what I what am I want to say? I think the reality is we're going to have to figure out how to make it better because people are not going to not do it right. So they were already googling things. Now that there's an AI, an, an enhanced AI option, they're going to do that too. So how do we improve these systems that are going to give them appropriate information and direct them to the appropriate resources for follow up. So it's okay if you I don't mind if somebody Google something and then comes to see me, but I, but I want you to come see me so that I can give you appropriate counsel um, and direct you in the in the right way. So I think we just have to figure out how to maximize these systems that we know people are going to use instead of trying to fight against them and help direct them to the appropriate um, level of care. I completely agree. Um, I think the end loop should be in-person care. Um, and I think that it, the disclaimer should be as transparent as possible, <laughs> just so, um, you know, we're not worsening outcomes. Um, because I, I, we've also talked to mamas where they felt um, that, you know, they didn't want to talk to the provider because they didn't feel safe. So that's why they were Googling, um, you know, all their different symptoms and trying to figure out what was wrong with them. And the problem is that, uh, you know, the, the real problem should should have been is that you need to find a new provider that you feel safe with and, and not that you're going back to the, you know, to Google and trying to diagnose yourself because you don't, they, there's so much information. There's so much false information out there. There's so much information that's hard to digest and, and honestly interpret as even as a researcher. So it's, it's, it's as hard as a patient, especially when you're stressed out. So I, I think that, um, like Mary is saying, this is this will happen. We need to know. We need to learn it and and make it improve it um, in safe ways. And, and with that starting, and in the process of through that is adding a disclaimer and making sure that the last message that you're sending to whoever is using your chat box is go see a provider, go see whatever provider that, that like, you know, that's resonates with the, with the ask, but there's still an in-person care that's, that's at the end loop of, of that chat. So um, yeah, that's, I think, I think that's, that's really important. Great point. And I think in maternity care in particular, like we're talking about life and death stuff, right? So I think it's really, really important that particularly the chat bots and um, other uh, like, uses of large language models in this space really have to consider uh, the, the risks there. Um, all right, it looks like we have time for at least like, just one more question. Um, we'll see how we are on timing. Um, but we have a question from Ushnish Sengupta. Um, what are the ways in which bias is introduced into the data collections uh, methods of the technologies being discussed? Are we setting up a system where the differences will be further amplified by AI and healthcare algorithms uh, using bias data to make decisions on allocation of resources. Um, Ijeoma, maybe you could talk about like that sort of imagined average user that is like a white middle-class woman and how you know bias might be introduced that way. And um, Mary, if you could talk about um, bias introduced on like the clinical side, we talked briefly about uh, bias in clinical notes, um, but other ways maybe that's encoded in the EHR and other forms of data collection. Yeah, I, I think that with data collection, what one uh, data collection is hard. Um, if you've done it, you understand it's hard to get people to fill out questionnaires on time in um, and an, an ample amount of people to in order to make um, any type of significant, um, you know, indications based off of, of the data that you collect. I, I would say that um, just the way that how funds, and Mary talked about this earlier, how funds are allocated, how, um, you know, recruitment goes, you know, it's, it's in the past, it's really been focused on um, who's easy to reach, like who, who is, who's right in front of me, and who is ready to answer all of my questions, right? Um, who trusts the healthcare system? And when you think about like, you know, when you think about like who fits in that box, it's not black women and it's not a woman of color or, or, or just like burden people who speak another language. Right. Uh, that's a whole nother step. 
So I think that in, in, in order for us to get more comprehensive, unbiased data, one, we need to figure out how to reach the hard to reach populations. That's a necessity. I think we need to figure out how to make it easy for researchers to be able to do that, right? Whether it's more funds, more timing, more resources, more collaborations or partnerships. Um, in a way where it's not the researchers' fault for not reaching those populations. It's it's a collaborative effort. It's a, it's a, a problem that we've identified across the board that everyone needs help with. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's that's where we start. Um, and and you know I, I I I agree, and I think from the clinical perspective, and and kind of to going back to that question. Um, the answer is yes, right? There's there's bias in the system, and it's going to be replicated in anything that we do unless we aggressively try to prevent it on the front end. Um, and so I think yes, and and how do we prevent it? I think the way, in other ways, the subtle ways it shows up. We talked about incomplete data. So sometimes people, when we talk about um, lack of of diversity and inclusion, sometimes people don't know how to talk to people who are different than them, right? So you're not going to ask the rest, race and ethnicity questions. You're not going to ask the gender questions. As we talk about, um, you know, very clinical things in, in the in the politicized maternal place that we are now, uh, are we going to ask about pregnancy losses and why they happened, right? Are we going to record those the right way? That's important for me to know that if people are uncomfortable either asking or giving that information that that's going to bias the system. Um, even thinking about having access, uh, patient access to the medical record. You know, a lot of the ways that we use the medical record is to communicate amongst providers, right? And so we do that a certain way. So we do need to um, maybe do a little, we talked about retraining earlier, whether training was right or wrong, but we probably do need a refresh and training on how we are the most objective and explicit in our note writing. Um, and, and so when the extraction part happens that we're actually extracting accurate data that's unbiased. So I think, you know, some of it is, you know, some, some amount of our notes need to be um, free text because they, we need to tell the story so that the next person reading the notes understands. But we also know that some amount of the notes need to be um, uh, check boxes or, or fillable blanks so that we can extract data, objective data in a meaningful way without interpretation. So I think that's a new balance that, um, you know, some of the bigger systems have that the, the evolving system, so the really big EHRs are actively involving. Um, some, but some of our EHRs are, are stagnant. They're in the same way for 20 years, right? And so I think as we build new systems, and there and there are some coming. There's some very innovative new EHRs coming. Some very um, promising EHRs specifically based uh, are to support maternal health. And so I think that will help us. Um, be more thoughtful about how we collect data and, and how we share it as well so that we can try to mitigate some of those biases on the front end because if we don't mitigate it on the front end it's, it's just going to be perpetuated through throughout the process great call to action um all right so we're up on time i think um to close us off i kind of just want to do a couple things. I want to shout out folks who attended today um, and who might be watching this online. Um, Black folks who are thinking about being pregnant, who've had a child, who are pregnant now, um, people who are just in community um, with those, those people, um, to really encourage you to read those doctor's notes, access your EHR, um, to know um, that, you know, the devices, the, the, the tools that you use, well, they can put you at risk um, to ask questions um, reach out to the people behind these apps um, and make sure that you know uh, where and how your data is being used. It's a really important part of a pregnancy journey um, for all people. Um, and I want to say thank you to our excellent panelists. Um, you all, you both are wonderful. And thank you so much for spending your time with me today. Um, thank you to all the folks at DNS who work behind the scenes to make this event possible. Um, and lastly, thank you to all the participants for my research who welcomed me into the maternal health world and shared their experiences uh, with me. So yes, thank you so much. Um, that's all we have for you today. For the questions that we couldn't get to, reach out to us. Um, but yes, thank you, thank you, thank you.